The X-Wing franchise launched over 25 years ago, and the series is still regarded as one of the best combat space sims ever made. It spans four games in total, X-Wing, TIE Fighter, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, and X-Wing Alliance. TIE Fighter especially is highly regarded by critics and fans alike. Over the past several years, a team has been hard at work at making an engine that could revive this old game by bringing it up to modern standards of graphics, sound, and modern inputs. Due to the nature of replicating something, you start to learn all kinds of things about how the original worked. Here are 15 things you probably didn't know about the original LucasArts classic, X-Wing. First, a few things you probably did know. This game has had several releases. The original game came on floppy diskettes and had two expansions, also on floppy diskettes. The expansions were Imperial Pursuit, which added a new tour of duty, which for some reason was mostly about grain. We received your grain shipment score. And B-Wing, which added a new starfighter, new training missions for it, and another new tour of duty. Later, these three releases were combined into one product called X-Wing Collector's Edition, which came out on CD-ROM, included the game and both expansions, and added voiceover to the briefings. Bonus fact, they that got the original voice actor that Squadron played Admiral Akbar, Eric Barsfeld, Ranger. to reprise the iconic role. We will draw off the escorts by launching a few torpedoes at the freighters. And lastly, the game was released as part of a collection called X-Wing Collector's Series, which used the X-Wing vs. TIE Fighters graphical engine and ran in Windows. Going forward, I'm going to refer to these games by the year they were released. So, X-Wing 93 for the floppy, X-Wing 94 for the CD version, and X-Wing 98 for the Windows version. All set? Okay, let's begin. X-Wing had two pre-release demos. The one most people are familiar with is the cutscene demo, which just plays the intro cutscene. But there was another, earlier one, which is more interesting. This demo was basically a slideshow of the alpha version of X-Wing, and there are some interesting and rare details of how the game looked early in development. Check out this X-Wing cockpit. Notice anything strange about it? I will bring them safely to Alderaan. The game artists took screenshots of the original films and recreated them for the game. Here is one example from Empire Strikes Back. Pretty well done, all in all, if you ask me. Can figure out which shots from the films these pictures were based on? X-Wing's game engine is based on the engine from Lawrence Holland's previous title, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe, lovingly nicknamed Swaddle. This game lets you fly both sides of World War II. Originally, X-Wing was going to let you choose to fly on either side of the Galactic Civil War II, just like Swaddle did. The concept was shelved but brought back for X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter. There are many elements from Swaddle that persist in the X-Wing series, like the interactive in-game map, the info bar at the bottom, the time compression, which would come back in TIE Fighter. Also of note, the use of historical missions, tours of duty, combat performance tracking, multiple internal cockpit views, and even a version of the film room called Gun Cam. Also, the landing gear and flap lever function in animation has a lot in common with the X-Wing's S-foils. The game features several easter eggs. First, freighters with names that, if you reverse them, reveal a hidden message. In the first mission of the first campaign, you destroy a bunch of freighters, which, if you reverse their names, you find out they're named after different video game companies, like Sierra, Origin, and Microprose. There are other examples throughout the campaign. Can you find them? There are Easter eggs in the concourse, too. For example, if you run the game on December 25th, you will find Santa Claus. Can you find Yoda, Chewbacca, E.T., Elvis? You may find Marilyn Monroe standing over the classic vent. Another small easter egg in the concourse involves music. First, a little side rant. Back before MP3 files and CD audio, video games used a music format known as MIDI, which is basically just synthesized music and sound. LucasArts pioneered and patented a technology they called iMuse, which lets games dynamically generate and transition musical cues based on what was happening in the game. 
This was most famously done in Monkey Island 2, but X-Wing and TIE Fighter both use this technology. You can see it in use in the concourse. If you mouse over the three hangars, the music modifies itself based on where the mouse is. For example, over the training grounds door, you get a jaunty tune, but mousing over the dangerous campaign, you hear the Imperial March. It's seamless and barely noticeable. And for a bonus fact, a peripheral called the Roland MT-32 was considered the creme de la creme of MIDI playback devices of the era, and X-Wing had special score files specifically composed to take advantage of this device's format. However, the score files only exist in X-Wing 93, so playing the original floppy version of the game is probably closest to the musical experience the original developers probably intended. If you want to learn more about the MT-32, LGR and 8-bit keys have both made great videos about it. Links below. Okay, that was a long one. Moving on. As I just explained, the music in the game came from composed MIDI tracks, and in some cases, the game cuts the MIDI tracks short because a cutscene is over, but sometimes the music composed was longer. So there is some unused musical data in the game to be found by dedicated fans. As for audio files, the game has two characters that give audible mission briefings, General Dadana and Admiral Akbar. Akbar does the tour of duty briefings, and Dadana does the historical mission briefings. Once you complete a tour mission, it can be replayed as historical, so the mission files understandably have two audio files, one for Akbar, one for Dadana. What is interesting is that there are dual voice files for every single mission, even for missions that can only be found in the historical missions. So there are files for Akbar to brief you on missions that in-game Akbar can simply never brief you on. Another bonus fact, Dadana is voiced by Clive Reville, the man who voiced the Emperor in The Empire Strikes Back. I'm not talking about the special edition. The original. You know, when the Emperor had chimpanzee eyes. Seriously, you can look it up. That's real. But not here to give you facts about Star Wars films, so back to X-Wing. When you complete Tour of Duty missions, ribbons get placed on your uniform. When you complete an entire tour, you get a medal. I mean, you don't play a Wookiee after all. It's a neat way to track your progress through the game at a glance by looking at your uniform. The original game had three tours of duty, and the expansions added two more for a total of five. However, the game art assets included ribbons for a non-existent sixth tour, and room for a non-existent sixth medal. Maybe they planned for another tour, but never got around to it? What's really interesting about this is that these exist in both the DOS and Windows versions of X-Wing. That means that some artists had to reproduce these six tour ribbons, knowing full well that they were never used and probably were never going to be used, as by this time the franchise had moved on from X-Wing and to other games, and no new expansions were planned. During gameplay, if your ship gets damaged, instruments can get destroyed. During development, apparently there was work done to add damage sprites not just to the instruments, but to the rest of the cockpit interior and to the starfighter itself as you look around from the inside. For some reason, this feature was never completed, but the external damage code can still be activated, allowing me to show it to you. It's a shame this was never implemented. These look really great. In Swaddle, you could click elements on the briefing map and a plate would pop up to tell you what that icon was, like a city or a squadron, stuff like that. This feature somehow made it into X-Wing, so if you pause the briefing by hitting stop and mouse over ships, you see the ship's target ID card. Even though this was preserved through all versions of X-Wing, all the way from DOS to Windows, it serves absolutely no purpose that I can think of. But it makes me wonder, why did they implement it? Maybe they planned on some kind of tactical planning from the briefing screen? Who knows. In one mission, Historical A-Wing 6, you inspect containers and you are surprised to discover there are TIE fighters hidden inside them, and they launch and attack you. But if you look closely at the briefing map, 
there are two red pixels that give away the surprise. This is because underneath the container icon is a TIE Fighter icon that's sticking out a little bit out the sides. This is probably an oversight, as hiding specific icons from the briefing map isn't particularly difficult to do. At the end of Tour 4, you know, after all the grain, you're awarded a medal called the Shield of Yavin. However, the cutscene shows you getting the Corellian Cross, which is the same medal you get for Tour 1. What makes this bug even worse is that it persists through all versions of X-Wing, all the way from DOS to 98, which means that because 98 has remastered graphics, someone remastered the cutscene, and because of a bug, the game never shows it to you. Whoops. Whoops. Whoops, A. The culmination of the original game, the third tour, ends in the climactic battle at the Death Star, which has two missions. The first mission has you clearing the area in preparation for the trench run assault, and the second mission, well, it's the famous trench run. However, both missions take place on the same map, but to hide the trench from the first mission, the game just spawns you about 40 kilometers away. Now, if you look closely at the horizon, you can just barely see the trench in the distance. But it's there, so if you fly towards it for long enough, you can reach it, and you're actually spawned uh, right on the same line as the exhaust port. So if you fly straight at the trench, you end up right at the exhaust port. Now, yeah, you can shoot it with a proton torpedo, but it doesn't start a chain reaction and the death jar doesn't explode. Many new players find the training ground maze to be the most tedious part of the game. You don't have to do it, but if you do, you get flight badges and a promotion, which perfectionists like me want to have on their uniform. But there is a way around this. A logic bug that lets you skip training levels. To do it, enter the maze, and instead of going through the first gate, double back and go through one or all of the gates of the previous platform and then go through the starting gate as you would normally. This bypasses the level entirely. Do this seven more times and you have your badge. And for a bonus fact, the training grounds become hardest at level 11. So if you have no trouble passing that level, you can continue advancing levels virtually forever. But there is a maximum level limit that if you reach it, the level indicator bugs out and rolls backwards. This is an illusion though. Only the display is bugged, and the game continues tracking your real level in the background and will show it to you on the debrief. But that number also has a limit. Can you find out what it is? It might take you a while. One of the releases I didn't mention earlier was that there was a Macintosh port of X-Wing. It featured new cutscenes, new concourse graphics, and an updated graphical engine running at a higher resolution. This release was the basis for X-Wing 98 and featured the same cutscene and concourse graphics. However, the X-Wing 98 release is much maligned by some fans for several reasons. The concourse, while higher resolution, doesn't look as vibrant and is generally a poor fitting style for Star Wars. X-Wing 98 also gutted the previously discussed MIDI IMU system and replaced it with non-interactive, repetitive Redbook audio tracks. The 3D models imported from X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter were not ideal. Just look at this Star Destroyer and this Lambda-class shuttle. I easily prefer the DOS versions. They also removed mouse flight support, removed the launch and landing cutscenes, and removed the pilot select feature. All in all, the X-Wing 98 was a gutted version of the game, and I cannot recommend it to anyone. Okay, that was a bit of a side rant, but I had to get that out of my system. X-Wing was made by a small team of passionate artists and programmers. The missions themselves were primarily designed and written by two people, who were also the game's lead testers. Two Davids, David Maxwell and David Westman. David Maxwell was a tester on Swaddle, and David Westman stayed and made missions all the way up to X-Wing Alliance. Throughout the X-Wing mission files, they left traces of who made which mission. 
Apparently, Maxwell in the early missions just numbered them sequentially as evidenced by all these missions with his name on it and a number. The game's lead developer, Lawrence or Larry Holland, made the Frigate Prime missions as those are named Larry 1, Larry 2, and Larry 3. Tours 4 and 5 had coded into the file names what tour and mission number it was, which craft the player was flying, if it was an A or B selectable mission, and another letter at the end to denote who made it, W for Westman, M for Axwell. So, did I miss anything? If I did, let me know in the comments. I might one day make another video like this for TIE Fighter, but um, it'll be a long time from now. Hard to tell. Anyway, if you want to learn more about X-Wing Virtual Machine, you can find more information on ModDB, Facebook, our Discord, and on my Twitch channel. Links below. So, if you get a chance, drop your socks, grab a joystick, and check out this old classic masterpiece. And remember, the Force will be with you always. best-selling 2013 book, Grain Brain, The Surprising mm -hmm. Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugars, Your Brain Silent Killers. So we ain't going nowhere till we get some grain.